Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back. Uh, another episode of Duff Unscripted. Um, I just saw this paper in Current Biology, and it caught my attention because I'm I'm a I'm a junkie for any news about ancient DNA. Right? Looking at ancient samples, uh, exploring them through uh, finding DNA that's been preserved in in this case sediments. And in this case, being able to look at a history of organisms over time uh, by watching changes in the genomes of these organisms. And so just real quick paper here. There's a lot of really technical stuff in this paper, and we're just going to just like hit some like the highlights from this thing. So this paper, current biology, late Pleistocene stickleback environmental genomes reveal the chronology of freshwater adaption. All right, sticklebacks are a, a, a type of fish and they've been studied. Uh, oh, there's lots of studies of sticklebacks. There's a real, it's a real favorite organism to look at because they have, um, there are species that live in freshwater, species that live in brackish water, species that live in salt water. And so there are locations on Earth, especially in the Western US, but in this case, we're gonna be looking at, uh, I think this is Sweden or something like that. Um, there are populations that, uh, because because water levels have, ocean levels have gone up and down, there are places that have at one time been in the sea or connected to the sea, and then as the ocean dropped, they ended up becoming lakes, which then became freshwater over time. And so any organisms that lived in that particular site have gone through a gradual transition of going from salt water to brackish water to fresh water. Uh, and if they've been able to adapt, they're still there, right? They didn't, they weren't killed by this transition. Um, they've likely gone through some adaptations to a, a, these, these different environmental conditions. And because we know many places where this has happened, especially since the last ice age, we can look at what we consider to be sort of recent evolutionary changes in populations. And this paper is gonna, is a really cool way of looking at those transitions. So sticklebacks have been, uh, their genomes have been sequenced. Lots of people looked at changes in different alleles that give them different traits in, in different, uh, like I said, salt water versus fresh water, but there's also other aspects too, like depending on what your predators are. Some sticklebacks lift in fresh water where they don't have any predators. Some sticklebacks live in freshwater lakes that still have predators. Uh, often that depends on the size of the lake and what other organisms can be uh, maintained in that particular lake. And so if you have a predator or not, sticklebacks form sticklebacks, all right? They have sharp, spiny projections on them. And in lakes where they don't have predators, they tend to lose those little spikes. And so lots of people have studied how they lose those spikes. And then if there's situations where a predator is reinduced and sticklebacks have been used to do actual experimental evolution where they've introduced into pop into lakes um, sticklebacks with different genetic backgrounds from different locations and then introduce them into new environments where they're met with new challenges like a predator and they've actually shown how over and actually watch these sticklebacks go through many many generations of natural selection in which case they select for the various genes that give them spines again, or put them in a non-predator uh, environment, and they will lose their spines over several generations, showing that the genome uh, traits are adapting over time in these various sites. Ah, anyway, back to this paper, All right? Just That's just a little background on sticklebacks and how useful they've been. And that's where this particular paper enters in because it's a new approach to looking at the history of populations of sticklebacks in, a, in one location. So what did they do? They sequenced late Pleistocene, um, three spine stickleback environmental genomes from sedimentary DNA, which is given this name CEDA, and that's just sedimentary DNA. That means you extract a sediment, right? Usually from a core, you take a core from a lake, you take a little area of the sediment from that, and then from that sediment, you extract all the DNA from it. And the idea is that as organisms die, and, or in this case, like fish scales fall off fish, and they fall to the bottom of the lake, and then eventually they're covered with other sediments, those things get preserved, and they don't all completely decay, and there's actually remnants of DNA molecules still left in there for thousands and thousands of years, in this case, for 
tens of thousands of years, there is the preservation of DNA. And that DNA can be extracted from soil, it can be sequenced, and then you can identify what organism that DNA belongs to and get a sense for what the sequences of those individuals were that were living at that time in which that sediment was deposited at the bottom of that lake. Uh, and what did they find out? They found out the genomes have a majority of marine adapted ancestry at adaptive loci. Oh yeah, I gotta, I'm going to have to show you where this lake is. All right, it, this is a case of where this lake is freshwater today, but it was a marine lake, a portion of the ocean at one time in the past. Um, and then they found that freshwater ancestry largely reflects findings of experimental releases. In other words, they found evidence that the changes that they see in this lake over time resemble the changes that have been observed in actual experiments that have been done where we've introduced fish to different uh, lakes on purpose. Uh, and then this paper is really kind of like a proof of principle. They're trying to show that you can use sedimentary DNA as a retrospective way of looking at uh, how uh, evolution has occurred in populations over time. Uh, so let's zip on down here. We've got Jan Lane and a bunch of different colleagues uh, from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, combined uh, along with uh, a couple institutions where we got Norway, Germany, Copen uh, Denmark, uh, and another one from Norway. Directly observing the chronology and tempo of adaptation in response to ecological change is a is rarely possible in natural ecosystems. Yeah, it's hard to watch that process occurring, right? Observing the chronology and tempo of adaption. Right? You can look at fossils, and you but but fossils are you know you have distinct separate fossils and you're kind of making the connections between them about how adaptation has happened. Um, but getting down to a fine scale, like at the genetic level, what is happening? What what are the actual alleles, the variants of the genes that exist at that particular time, and how do those allele frequencies change? Which is sort of our basic definition of evolution: the change in allele frequencies in populations over time. Uh, sedimentary ancient DNA, that's CETA, has been shown to be a traceable research uh, uh, source of genome scale data in long dead organisms, right? But they leave some of their DNA behind and to therefore potentially provide an understanding of the evolutionary histories of past populations. To date, time series of ecosystem diversity has been reconstructed from CETA DNA, typically using DNA metabarcoding or shotgun sequence data generated from less than one gram of sediment. Uh, here we maximize sequence coverage by extracting DNA from 50 times more sediment per sample than the majority of previous studies. So instead of one little tiny bit of sediment and trying to get a little DNA, they took a large amount of sediment and tried to grab a lot of DNA from it, representing a snapshot in time. Uh, from a time series in the late Pleistocene sediments spanning from a marine to freshwater ecosystem. So they have identified the sediments in the bottom of a lake that they believe represent the transition from this was marine and then it was brackish and then it was freshwater. Uh, at this level. And that has to do with the the soil chemistry at that location and the types of um, the types of sediments that are there. Uh, yeah, let's get let's just go down to the figure because this is I, this is really why I wanted to bring this paper up to, to show you this kind of interesting uh, test case uh, in history. So this lake I see down here, this lake which is 34 meters above sea level. So today the lake is 34 at the top of the lake. It's 34 meters over 100 feet above sea level but in the past sea level was higher all right and so the sea went over this boundary right so it was just like there was this this little you know dip right here and then here's the land over here and so here's the coast and so you had high tide low tide both of them are enough that they're going to mix the water completely in here even if there's a stream of fresh water coming into this area but then you know you could have a slight bit of, you know, less salty water in this area. But then what happens is, is as the sea level goes down, you reach a point where maybe only high tide is mixing with the waters in this. You can think of this as a bay, right? And then, but at low tide, maybe it gets cut off. I've seen this in Maine, right? And high tide, the water comes up and it moves into a marshland 
Uh, but in low tide, stuff is draining out and there's actually a disconnect between the two during low tide. And you have to wait till back to high tide again before water gets mixed again. And there's a stream that runs into that. So that's going to be brackish water. It's not going to be completely as salty as the ocean is. Uh, and then as sea level continues to fall, all right, then what you have is you have uh, fresh water because you have fresh water coming in and eventually that's going to get rid of all the salt and then you don't have any ability for the salt to get back in, right? Now you might be wondering, how does the ocean fall? All right, how does the ocean level go down? I mean, I just talked in, I mean, if you saw one of my other videos recently about um, uh, hunting structures found some 50 feet below the, the seawater in an area very close to this, right? Um, and we said there in the ice age, right? So much ice was, so much water was in ice that the ocean level was lower. But here we're talking about the ocean level being higher um let's see post glaciation isolation basin with an isolation age of 12,900 they're saying 12,900 years ago it, it finally was completely isolated and therefore became uh salty which means this would have been during the ice age you would have had this higher tide right this higher water amount and you would have had this bay connected how does that work in norway when you might think that it was lower and then it would have raised so here's a little different thing that's going on. What's going on here is isostatic, isostatic rebound. Um, the land is covered with massive glaciers over here, all right? And because of these massive glaciers, right, the land is actually is suppressed, right? The weight of the ice itself pushes the land down. And then as the ice is melting, all right, it's relieving the weight on the land. And as it does so, the land begins to rise. And so the land is actually rising faster than the ocean is rising. Those are pretty wild, huh? right? You know, the, the ocean levels are actually coming up because the water's melting, but they're having to raise the entire ocean because this, this sea is connected to the, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. Right. And that whole sea is not rising that fast. <laughs> like, is it like a, you know, an inch a year, you know, inch or two a year at, at most during a really, like a, a really intense period of melting. Um, not, you know, but today is rising, but, you know, on the order of millimeters um, per year. Um, but the land is rising at a faster pace. And because of that, the land's rising up and this bay is rising up and eventually gets disconnected from the sea. So, the stickleback fish, which live in the ocean and were freely able to swim in this area as well, you know, for a while there, for a period of maybe a few hundred years, they're getting uh, an opportunity to live in brackish water. And sticklebacks have a wide variety of different alleles and genetic variation. So sticklebacks that at the time are swimming around this brackish water are the ones that have the ability to live in brackish water to closer to fresh water are probably being selected for in that area. Now they can kind of go back and forth, uh, but there's going to be more individuals in this population that are going to be selected for and interbreeding in this area. And therefore what you have is a changeover from the variants that were best fit for the saltwater environment the variants that were rare in salt water, because they're like rare mutations that come up, but not really useful to those organisms. But now they're useful in the brackish water and they become higher and higher in frequency because selection is selecting for them. And of course, after it gets completely disconnected and it's in fresh water, then there's a bunch of different mutations and a bunch of variation that might have already existed prior that is useful in a freshwater environment and therefore becomes uh much more well actually goes to fixation meaning like all the fish in that freshwater then have that particular trait and that's what uh figure a over here is trying to show so like you know in the original population which is marine you've got all these different fish and they're well adapted for living in a marine environment and there's like one fish that has a couple of variants that are like they 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 would actually like do all right in a less salt water environment less marine environment they can survive in that marine environment, but they're maybe it's not those aren't the most beneficial alleles, and yet they have those mutations.
just like all populations have variations and not every variation is like the best variation for that environment. Um, but then when you go through this transition zone and you start to get into the brackish water, then selection begins to quickly select for the individual fish that have the positive, what is now a positive variation. It's a beneficial mutation if you live in this brackish water and it begins to spread in the population, just meaning those individuals survive and reproduce more often than other ones that are more marine adapted. And eventually when you get down to the point where you have a freshwater lake, you're like, all the fish have those particular alleles. In other words, what was rare originally now is common. And so how did they, how did they determine this graphic right here? Like the fish, this is just represent, well, this is, I'm not going to explain this. Oh, wait, let me show you this real quick. So I'll get back to what I was going to say. Um, here is the uh, sediment core. All right, you've got seven and a half meters, like 20 some feet of muck, basically, which is freshwater sediments that is runoff from the land, bringing in sediment that's piling up, right, over the last 12,000 years. And then right down here, you have a transition between this mud and this silt and sand that you had. This would have been runoff during uh, the more, uh, when most water was eroding, melting off the glaciers, right? And at that time, the land is like, you know, because the glaciers are moving back, there's not much vegetation there and you just got lots of sand and you have lots of larger uh, particles. Um, they're in there and certain th they're even showing like the you know, rocks and stuff like that because of the violence in which stuff is brought into this particular area. Uh, and so, as I said, there's this, there's this one spot right here where 7.69 to 7.70 meters. So a 10th of a meter, you've got lacustrine environment, which is lake, like this is freshwater lake sediment. And then just below that you have brackish laminations. Uh, you have little layers where you can see where the, the tides and so forth are, are, are going back and forth, bringing in sediments or changing the way they're being laid down. And then below that, you've got marine silt. So there's a very distinct area in the, in the column of the, uh, that they've cored down into this, what is today a lake, that tells them, yes, this was marine. This was connected to the ocean at one time. And then you went through this transition phase and this is where they took their sediment profiles right? and they extracted DNA from them. Right. And actually I like the, I like the tubes right here showing the color, right. Of the sediments. So showing that like there's even a transition in the color. So that represents more organic material and, and different, a lot of mud and all kinds of other things that are finer silts, fine, you know, clay elements uh, in the lake sediments. Right. And then in those sediments are little bony plates, right? Little, um, uh, the scales of fish, S fish lose scales all the time. And scales are made up of tissue, um, uh, with bone in it, right? They're bone, but they're surrounded by cells and those fall to the bottom of the lake. And then they pile up along with the sediments. And so what, is, what a lot is being extracted is you're extracting that, you're extracting the DNA from cells that came from those bony plates. By the way, they extracted DNA from everything that was in the sediment, which would be bacteria and algae and like microorganisms and, uh, you know, all that stuff, right? And any other types of fish that live there. And what they do is they just extract it all and they sequence like millions and millions and, well, billions and billions of base pairs from that sediment. And they just, use computers and databases in order to search all that sequence and say like, what's this similar to? And they're what they're all they're looking for are stickleback sequences, right? Cause we have stickleback genome sequences, uh, from all kinds of species and variations. And so you just look for those sequences and then you build a genome. In this case, they, they looked at hundreds of millions of base pairs of DNA from sticklebacks that were in these different layers. And that's where they estimate what the community looked like at the time, right? They're looking at the variation in different genes. So they collect, they might've sequenced the same gene thousands of times from one layer of sediment. And in those thousands of times, they see that like only once or twice did they see a particular variant, meaning it's really rare. And then as you move up the column, you see that that particular variant becomes more and more and more and more common until pretty much everybody has it.
you're really looking at evolution in action. You're seeing the genome change. In that lake, in that population, you're watching the population change by actually looking at the community structure, the genomic community structure uh, of those organisms. Um, yeah, and so these are complicated figures that are showing across the genome where different variants are that are represented in the freshwater lake versus the fjord. The fjord would be like the what is the ocean today uh, and the sticklebacks that are still living out there. Uh, and so you can look at uh, the freshwater ones predicted and the, and the freshwater, well, you can look at the freshwater fish uh, that are there today and the freshwater fish that were living there 12,000 years ago. And you can see that they, uh, well, you can't see that clearly from this figure at all, but well, what they show is that uh, they very quickly change. And then they've been kind of about the same ever since as they've lived in the freshwater, uh, showing very fast adaption uh, to that new location. Um, yeah, I think that's that's mostly what I wanted to uh, get across here. The, 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 it's just the cool thing about this type of technology, and I was attracted to this paper because I talk a lot about ancient DNA in a couple of my, my classes, and I've uh, done a little bit of ancient DNA stuff myself. And it's just fascinating to me to be able to go in and extract DNA from organisms that have been dead for hundreds of years, thousands of years, in some cases now for hundreds of thousands of years. And now we're able to actually compare past organisms with present organisms and that gives us so much more ability to look at so many more interesting questions that we could never address before in the past and i think you know growing up meaning even as a professor as somebody doing science for 25 years when i started this job it just i never would have imagined the types of things we could do today i mean the whole thing of being able to sequence genomes it just blows my mind but now I think about sequencing a genome of past life um, and we're finding just better and better technologies for extracting this DNA from the environment. I'm not going to pretend that the DNA found from the environment is like somehow like you just easily do this. It is broken. It's got damage to it. But we're, we have chemical methods of cleaning and fixing damage. Um, and then we have, uh, I'll say, uh, mathematical tools and algorithms in order to identify where typical mutations or mistakes are made in the sequencing of ancient DNA to get better and better and better and better at, at getting uh, as close to as accurate sequence from the past as possible. Uh, ancient DNA comes with certain risks in terms of reading some sequences wrong, but, but there are so many better technologies today to figure out and identify those risks and be able to avoid them, making ancient DNA much more useful than it's ever been. And I expect it will only get better over time. After all, we've sequenced the entire genome of mammoths and Neanderthals and dire wolves and um, basically all ice age mammals will eventually have their entire genome sequenced. So all the extinct ones, um, like there's extinct rhinoceri and the saber-toothed tiger and, you know, all those things have already been sequenced. Um, but now we're also sequencing ancient horses and ancient versions of organisms that are alive that we have descendants of today. And so this allows us to see how their genomes have changed over time. All right. Uh, really neat paper from Current Biology. This is an open access um, article, which is why I'm sharing it, able to share it here. Yep, that's it for me. That's stuff unscripted for today. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.